Hi. Hello, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Long time no see. It's true, and with COVID, it feels like everything is a decade longer than it actually was. <laughs> yeah, you're looking great. Thanks. I have fond memories of um, where, you know, meeting you at that conference, Mermaids, Maritime Folklore and Modernity in Copenhagen in late 2017. And yes. you, were, you were doing the, the keynote and it must have been at the time that Swim Pretty, your book, Aquatic Spectacles and the Performance of Race, Gender and Nature had just come out. Um, that is true. I thought today I'm talking to you. Thank you for coming online and talking to me. I have Annette, I think, behind me, um, Annette Callerman, who many mermaids I've spoken to consider the first professional mermaid, although I guess that's up for some debate. But certainly she links the lineage of mermaiding to performances on screens, which is highly relevant. But um, I wondered if we could talk a little bit first before we discuss the presentation of her in Esther Williams' Million Dollar Mermaid, just about some of the big ideas in Swim Pretty and, um, you sure. know. Sure. Um, I, I grew up going to Wikiwachi in Florida, which is the city of live mermaids, um, although their city status has, you know, I think it might have disappeared. Um, but I became interested in how that show came to be, uh, and it seemed historical to me uh, when I was seeing it in my lifetime, and so I knew it had to come from somewhere. Uh, and so in the course of that, I learned sort of about the early film mermaids um, and the history of mermaid performance, which does go back before Annette Kellerman, although I would say Annette Kellerman made a huge difference in terms of advocating for swimsuits that allow for actual mobility because they used to weigh 40, 50 pounds and be made out of wool. Um, and uh, water water cleanliness, they also sort of, as swimming as swimming became more of a thing, um, mm. early mermaid performers were some of the advocates for stopping things like dumping uh, refuse in the water, which made the swimming areas really disgusting. Um, mm. So uh, while there were performers at Hippodromes or mm. Sadler's Wells before that, or even back to Roman spectacles, um, the, the mermaids, uh, from Kellerman's era sort of really are the ones that we modern, we, we think of in the modern era as the kind of mermaid performances that have a really long legacy, mm. um, even to this day and sort of set the standards for what we expect. Um, and so those standards are what I was really interested in determining, like, how did these performances come to be? What do they have in common with other mermaid performances? Uh, and so I argue and swim pretty for what I call an aesthetics of dissension, which are the sort of artistic hallmarks that a lot of water spectacles have in common and still do. Uh, and those include things like hiding technology. There's a lot of technology that goes into water performances and even those early films. Um, but we hide all of that so we can create a fairy tale world below the surface. Uh, that world often aligns women and people of color with a sort of natural primitive world in opposition to the masculine world of industry on the land. Um, there's a lot of use of pastel, of those uh, music that's very soothing, um, and it all kind of constructs what's considered to be a family-friendly mermaid, because uh, mermaids are always chaste. They can appeal to the dad and the tourist thing, um, but they're half fish, so they can be pretty, but they're not ever fully sexualized. Um, and so I looked at that aesthetics, which I sort of start with the 1939 New York World's Fair mm. and the Aquacade that Billy Rose constructed, um, mm. and that some of those early mermaid performers were definitely in, uh, and then went to Wikiwachi and Ocarina Springs, and ultimately does connect directly to SeaWorld parks today. Mm. Um, SeaWorld was, uh, the folks from Wikiwachi went to create those SeaWorld parks, um, but what we expect from our mermaid performers sort of morphed along the way into performing with apex predators, uh, with orcas. And that obviously was not a sustainable or wise choice. No, I think that conference was such a kind of amazing, amazingly intellectually rich um, feast for me, set inside a very brutalist benign building in Copenhagen. Um, it's true. <laughs> But I think I had, yeah, I, I hadn't heard of the, the World's Fair 
the the two water shows that you mentioned, mm-hmm. Billy Rose's Aquacade, which Esther Williams is in, right? Or she works with Billy Rose. Yeah, um, Eleanor Holm was the big star. Mm. Uh, Eleanor Holm, and she was she was another swimming performer. She was married to Billy Rose. Um, she had been on the U.S. women's team, but was not allowed to compete in the Olympics because she drank champagne scandalously on the boat on the way to the Olympics. Oh my god! Uh, they kicked her off the team. Um, they. They argued that she was a, a, a raging alcoholic, and she argued <laughs> that uh, the chaperone had propositioned to her, and she had turned him down. So he had figured out a way to get her kicked off for drinking. Um, but yes, and um, Weissmuller, Johnny Weissmuller, who went yes. on to be Tarzan and Buster Crab, yeah. um, a lot of those early water performers were mm. involved, and yeah, Esther Williams as well. Yeah, yeah, it was interesting. And then, of course, because I'm from a background in contemporary art, I was fascinated to hear hear about Dali's Dream of Venus as the show that bombed, but that offered a kind of different view to the to Billy Rose's Aquacade, which really took off and is what is kind of similar to what we see in Wiki Wachi. In my show here in New Zealand, I've been lucky to get Andrew Brusso's permission to show one of his videos of, of a very nostalgic, beautiful Wiki Wachi performance. Oh, excellent. So it's that, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, so that shows in the background and we have a glass case with Annette Kellerman's um, a, a vintage tail that she would have worn on land, you know, at soirees, I guess, um, in, in the foreground. You, I, I think one of the big things that struck me was your taxonomy of water when I saw your keynote and thinking about, oh yeah, why a woman so associated with water and water has got a lot more to it than meets the eye when we're just absorbing these performances like, you know, water itself is being staged. And I suppose it just brought that to my consciousness in a way that I I hadn't had that awareness before. And I started thinking about, well, yeah, like, is the moon, are are we the womb of the world or what? Like, why are women in water so linked? Mm. Yeah. So I, um, I, I looked at water in um, the performance that I look at take place in outdoor water spaces. There were other things at that conference. Um, Tracy Davis, another theater historian, referred to water as a technology because she was coming at it as a much more theatrical stage perspective. And I was coming more from a performance studies perspective. Um, But, you know, I think that there is sort of what might be called natural water, although nothing on earth at this point is untouched by humans, but it's geographically occurring water that we have sort of more or less left alone and perhaps um, lakes rivers, these kinds of things. Um, the ocean, uh, to some extent, right, is a thing that that is there, uh, mm-hmm. that we did not put there. Uh, and then there's what I would call domesticated water, which is those same geographical things that we have somehow intervened to put a stage into. Um, so Wikiwachi has an underwater theater that they built down into, so you could see under the spring. Mm-hmm. Um, Ocarina Springs had a submarine theater that was the mm-hmm. same sort of thing, only, you know, novelty. Mm. And they lowered you down below the surface of the spring so that you could see. Uh, and that's all in opposition mm. to fully domesticated water, which is water that comes into artificial tanks through pipes. Um, that water is not completely without its own will and mind. So, so SeaWorld was using domesticated water, but the red tide, so they were pumping the water in and the red tides made it so that their tanks were completely opaque when they first opened without the filtration systems. Um, so all of these all of these natural things, no matter how domesticated or tamed they are, will push back um, and sort of at the end of the day, you know, natural forces are larger than human control, even if we don't think so. Um, and they will make that presence known. So I, I sort of was very interested in what kinds of water performances were in what kinds of spaces and how much control the humans who created those performances thought that gave them. So for example, SeaWorld's in the most controlled kind of water, and then all of a sudden we're introducing danger by putting apex predators in that space, which those folks seem to think they had full control over. But like I said, they didn't, neither the water nor the non-human animals in it. Um, And so certain kinds of water spaces are very intentionally chosen for certain ideological purposes. Have you seen Million Dollar Mermaid? And what do you think of some of those? I have not in a very long time. Um, mm. 
not enough to speak on it intelligently. I'm more familiar with uh, Mr. Peabody's Mermaid and some other mm -hmm. um, films that are from relatively the same era, but that's all a little bit before, a little bit before and a little bit outside. Um, I draw a boundary around film often just because I'm like, I'm talking about so much theater and performance that I'm going to leave yeah. film for the movie, the movie experts. Yeah. What do you think? Um, I am curious though about the relationship to nostalgia that you identify with um, presentations of water performances. And so in Million Dollar Mermaid, it's very much um, creating a big Busby Berkeley choreographed spectacle of um, aqua shows, which uh, don't really exist in the same ways anymore or seem to have morphed into synchronized swimming. You know, Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift just stole from that for her most recent video. Oh, God. And Glee. Glee yeah. also did a big water spectacle in one of their... So it, there's still... the she uh, Taylor Swift used Busby Berkeley in her, her most recent video, um, which actually was also pulling from a lot of um, showgirl, chorus girl kind of things with uh, references to gemstones, um, just like the, the Ziegfeld Follies girls yeah. were characterized. Um, so they're still around. I noted that. Um, but I think, and I, but I think she's drawing on nostalgia too, right? Mm, yeah. Um, and the water space is, like I said, usually a space of fairy tales. It's supposed to be a space that's exotic and apart from industrialized society. So there's a ton of nostalgia that goes into that. Uh, and along with that seems to be this spectacle of very idealized feminine beauty, um, that you can look at, but not touch that's family friendly, um, but still kind of sexy. And there's a lot of notion, there's a lot of appeal in, these often leisure vacation spaces being different from our day-to-day -day lives. And that difference seems to be that nostalgia um, element of it. And the Busby Berkeley stuff was also being heavily influenced by military and the impact of the wars on culture and the idea of large scale, unified sets of movement and dance that aren't dance like ballet or modern, they're, you know, choreographed mm. sort of mechanized kinds of movements, um, which was a which was a major influence in the spectacles at that time. Um, and you can still see in sort of Olympic opening ceremonies as well, the Chinese one had that same large scale mechanized yeah. kind of choreography. Yeah, that is very much a feature. Oh, it's interesting. When I went and, and did some of my physical journeys to meet mermaids, I went to Fort Lauderdale and I went to the wreck bar. I wanted to go to the wreck because Medu Serena set the show up herself. I was interested in women who were self-starters. I mean, I know Wiki Watchy is far more famous, but it's also far more documented. And it's yes. someone else's vision that of course, women populate with their own skills. Um, but one day I wandered, I wandered the local area and wound up in the swimming um, hall of fame, the museum there oh, along the beach in yeah. Fort Lauderdale. And there's this dusty older part of it with the history of swimming presented. And I think until I walked in there, I'd never really thought about swimming as having a history. I'd never thought about how pools became popularized or even how swimming had become popularized. And I was very interested in, or there's a, a stuffed kind of statue of Johnny, Johnny, how do you say his surname? Oh, Weissmuller? Yeah, he's in a corner there with a bobcat and a stuffed turtle and a wax of course you know, he is. thing of him um, as Tarzan. But then I became really aware, ah, oh, these, these features with mermaids in them were very linked to people, to early film and to people mm -hmm. figuring out how to make films that had water elements. Um, yes. And, and, you know, I think Newt Perry, who set up Wiki Watchy himself was scouting for locations and helping film locations. So um, it's just all tied up with quite a fictitious presentation of what it means to be underwater. Well, and the earliest, these earliest attractions were before um, sort of Jacques Cousteau's work to mm. make underwater world accessible to audiences through film. 
So they are using the same spectacle as film. You sit on one side and there's a glass that separates you from what's happening. So you and they the, the performers underwater obviously cannot hear the audience in the way that you can in other kinds of theatrical presentations. So it's very filmic the way that mm. these early theaters are set up. And then um as technology developed within film, that became a much more accessible, much more popular way, um, which sort of rendered under the water a little bit less exciting and a little bit less mysterious to folks than it was when these early attractions were happening. Oh, yeah, that's a very good point in itself. What, uh, several years on from Swim Pretty, what stays with you about having written that book and the kind of... Uh, conversations that might have provoked for you yes um one thing that really uh i was excited about is that one thing i talk a lot about in swim pretty is the overwhelming whiteness of mermaids Mm. um and of these attractions and so i was very excited when they announced i'm not super excited in general about the live action disney films but i was really excited when they announced that they were going to do a live action little mermaid with a black actress Mm. um and i i was very happy to be a little bit out of date um, the discourse around that has been uh, disappointing, although not surprising. There's a lot of pushback against that actress, mm. um, Halle Bailey. Um, there's a lot of pushback against defiling what a mermaid is supposed to be. Like, like there are politicians mm. who argue that mermaids are white, um, as if mermaids are real <laughs> and, and yeah. historical, and that that makes any sense. Um, there's pushback against the way that she sort of interpreted the music, which is almost identical to the original but with a little bit of an r&b flair um so i i'm i'm not surprised but disappointed about how little progress has sort of been made in the media about diversifying mermaid depictions um on the other hand there's a lot uh there's the society of fat mermaids who Mm -hmm. i follow on instagram and there's a lot um of more body positive lgbtq positive mermaids um Post my book, the sort of association of mermaid with the trans community became more of a thing. Um, and so all of those, I think, are uh, things that I I note and um, things that I am sort of excited about as they kind of disrupt the arguments that I was making in really positive ways, I think. Um, and then uh, it's one of those things where people like... <laughs> You know, mermaids sort of had their big moment, as I I think you know, and maybe they moved on a little bit. But I'll I'll still hear from folks about the mermaids and things. And then I moved. I now live about 45 minutes from Wikiwachi. Mm. Uh, So that's that's very interesting how all of this and now my life is sort of back Mm. at the Wikiwachi parks and back by the ocean. Um, And so I I did grow up having to be uh, on the swim team. And knowing exactly how hard swimming is and exactly sort of some of the training and history that went into it. And I was not, a I was a, okay, I'm a a good swimmer. I was never a fast swimmer. I was never Nanette Kellerman. I wasn't even a pretty swimmer. Mm. um, So I did not swim pretty. Uh, So I think a lot of what I've been interested in is knowing very viscerally the um, athletic demands of swimming and then yeah. the sort of cultural narratives around it that still exist um, and how those things don't don't really coincide in a realistic fashion. Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, for me, it's been a strange thing for me to end up preoccupied by, given that I can't swim. Uh, well, you know. didn't you go do mermaid training? I thought you did go do the mermaid training. Oh, look, I did when I was in Fort Lauderdale because, you know, the classes are much more um, widespread across um, yeah. the US. I did go and do a class one on one with, um, you know, a mermaid class, just me and the trainer. And yeah, I mean, Jenny, for me, it was a totally abject experience. Like I'm underwater being told to blow bubble kisses. Yes. And it was just so bizarre for me. Like I got up at a festival and I've been asked to write and speak something about shame and I got up and and spoke about that experience and I remember a critique later online saying oh it was nothing really that you'd you'd hesitate to mention at a 
you know, at a party with friends. But for me, it was deeply shameful. Like there was something about the way I've been raised and brought up and what I value about myself, that being underwater blowing some bloody bubble kisses and roiling about like a huge, you know, haggis made me feel totally bizarre. Um, but I, I really appreciate the skill set in others. And I, I, I think I'm interested in the conundrum of mermaiding because, you know, I, I can see the limitations, but I still want to see a really pretty mermaid sipping grapeette underwater by a ridiculous seahorse if I can. I still want to see it and consume it. <laughs> yeah. No, I, yes, I completely understand, like having grown up wishing that I could be one of the really good swimmers and then, you know, being taken to Wikiwachi where it was so effortless for them yeah. that it, would, it looked like no labor at all to the point where I didn't even understand the mechanics of how the show worked and how they did what they did. And the mechanics are actually quite terrifying if you watch the behind the scenes videos. Um, well, they go down that enormous tunnel too. Yeah, to the really the scary tunnel. Um, yeah, it is frightening. Yes. So I, I think... Um, they're so culturally endemic and so bound up in notions of femininity and um, culture and, you know, natural, like being natural in the world uh, that even if you're like, wait a second, um, at the same time, you're still like, okay, but also wouldn't it be great to be like, they look so relaxed and they, they make it all look so easy, both like swimming and life. So there is an appeal to that. Yeah, there is. And I think I've spoken to a lot of people who either perform, you know, who perform professionally the the role of the mermaid or recreationally. And it brings up all sorts of different things, like mindfulness is quite a big part of it. And um, a lot of women and people have, uh, the water is their happy place. That's what I learned linked them and somewhere where they feel deep comfort. And for me, it isn't. And I don't think you can easily turn that around. (laughs) Certainly you can't turn it around in an hour. Um, Right. No, no, no. (laughs) Not with a tail on or what have you. (laughs) But it is highly athletic, especially, you know, there are all sorts of different performers like Hannah Mermaid, who's in my show, who can perform you know at depth in the ocean then there's yeah. others like Medu Serena who can do you know atmospheric shows and swimming pools but they have a really big vocabulary for how they do how they learn to stay down and look yes. comfortable when they're not comfortable well you know, yes mm. I think um probably one last thing to point out is uh, perhaps how tied up mermaids are with tourism. Oh, yes. So a lot of tourism in Western nations was developed around um, visiting exotic others. Mm. And that's frequently depicted as Eastern cultures um, or Polynesian or South Seas cultures. Uh, but the other, you know, the ultimate other space for the longest time was under the ocean, right? And I, I guess we kind of see there, we're seeing the flip side of that with all of these billionaires sending themselves into space, <laughs> yeah, uh, a sort of other kind of tourism that we can't, we most of us cannot access. They're just mm. very inhospitable places under the ocean and up in space. Uh, so for sure, mermaids sort of stood in. Um, for everything that we could not have in our day-to-day lives. They were free of chores. They were free of industrialized labor. They were free of, uh, it's never fully explained who they eat or how they eat them because some of their fish friends have got to be food. Uh, Although I have seen it argued that they're all depicted as so thin because they live on seaweed. Um, (laughs) It's a fairly common argument, Um, but they're sort of our ambassadors to this other world that is, um, and it actually, I mean, it actually is, right? Having grown up swimming, um, I would spend a lot of time sort of off by myself, swimming from one side of the pool to the other underwater. Um, And it's just, it is very quiet and the light looks Mm. very different and you aren't subject to the sort of social dynamics in a neighborhood in Louisville, Kentucky that I didn't really belong in. Mm. Um, It was a, a, it was an escape. It was a vacation to Mm. sort of put myself there and to not be able to hear or see that other 
world space. And so the mermaid is sort of the stand in for, you know, for folks like you who don't swim, mm. um, but who can have that ambassador to that other space. Um, mm. And I, in a swimming pool, I can ignore there's no flora or fauna, right? Like there's mm. nothing to actually make my life dangerous. And, no, and for the most part, when we see mermaids um, in film or television or theater, they they similarly are divorced from, you know, the wiki watching mermaids were kept separate from mm. alligators, for example. Uh, so so I think, yeah, they, they are to transport us to a touristic location where we can escape our sort of tedious, um kind of miserable lives for a little bit <laughs> that's definitely part of what they've been for me <laughs> yeah exactly that's right but I think um I I just wonder too about it's interesting to think that they've always been linked to aquariums the performance yes, of, always. of mermaids and to think about oh well gosh when did aquariums arrive how did they arrive and then realizing how colonial this history is of... yeah I actually did a little I've been doing research post that book into the earlier aquariums um, particularly uh, the first ones in the United States which all were clustered in New England mm -hmm. um, one of the earliest aquariums in the United States was set up by P.T. Barnum yeah. um yeah, yeah right who yeah. uh had whales in tanks in his uh museum um the whales died tragically and horribly when the museum burned down and they broke the tanks so that they could have the water to try to put the fire out and the whales sort of suffocated and burned to death but even in those most the in the most early aquariums in the united states um, they they did have a mermaid kind of figure. Um, there's a drawing from the 19th century of a girl who went to the aquarium. I forget if it was in, I think it was in Massachusetts. And she saw a woman being pulled around by um, probably beluga whales. So they set up a little chariot and they plunked this woman on it and she was being pulled around. And she does a really great illustration of that and what she saw at the, the earliest possible aquarium in the United States. So um, it has always been a really weird feature that uh, fish, whales, sharks, not exciting on their own. So it would be, <laughs> it's, it, you know, for whatever reason, everyone's impulse is to stick a woman in there. Yeah. Yeah, it is fascinating. And to hear earlier in our conversation that perhaps activism has always been linked with mermaiding, yeah. which is very much a strong kind of identity or consciousness uh, uh, amongst people who are mermaid now. Um, yeah, because even in the sort of sexual exploitation of things like Aquacade or the, the early films, mm. um, those women, I think, by virtue of needing to be effortless athletic performers had a really strong sense of who they were and what they were capable of mm. um, and what they wanted to accomplish within the systems that they had. Um, and so I think, you know, it's a it's a dual identity where I, I can't look at those women and say like, oh, that is an empowered action to be in a bikini being sort of objectified for how you look. But at the same time, um, Annette Kellerman, um, Eleanor Holm, these were women who knew what they were capable of physically. And so, you know, that that sort of propelled a voice where they argued for change and they argued for social intervention and they argued for more autonomy. Um, and I think that comes out of being able to excel and, you know, live in a space in the water where most everyone else couldn't. Mm. Yeah, I think Annette Kellerman seems like she rejected the title of feminist in her own lifetime, born as she was in, you know, 1886. Yes, yes. she was very much an entrepreneur, you know. She yes. went through several careers, transitioning from vaudeville into silent screen, running yep. health businesses, health food shops, another big link with current mermaids, and just how her athleticism and her refusal to be bogged down in unnecessary clothing in the water did end yep. up paving a way for for women to take up swimming in a more realistic manner a hundred percent and and allowed them to take up swimming in a competitive manner because yeah. before that intervention into the bathing suits themselves there was no competitive women swimming it wasn't possible or feasible so that was um it was a huge change in terms of uh the whole trajectory of swimming history honestly one of the things that stunned me and stayed with me at from the um, Florida Swimming Hall of Fame 
was not the display for Billy, but Billy Rose's Aquacade. It was this um, set of, you know, plaques about the Great Slocum disaster, or it was about some kind of fire that was on a cruise, a pleasure cruise ship that was just off the coast of somewhere like New York. And it was only a few yards of swimming, yet tragically, mainly women and girls and others died because they yes. couldn't swim. People couldn't swim. And it, right. said, it said on the plaque that, um, that that accident was the biggest loss of life before 9-11 in and around wow. New York. Um, I, I haven't peer reviewed that, Jenny, but um, that really <laughs> that really stayed with me. Um, yes. That yeah, swimming I, was not available to many. No. Like yeah. I said, the earliest swimming for the, like, obviously it's geographically dependent, right? People who yeah. lived in the South or who had yeah. uh, access to water would have a different relationship. But up in New England, um, the only place that people could swim was sort of, you know, in the bay or in the rivers. And those were often filthy and disgusting and not places that you wanted to go into. And there's stories about like going down to the pools that are built in uh, in New York to the sort of the river and, you know, carcasses float by because they just threw everything mm. into the water. Um, and so there was no desire or uh, impetus to learn to swim. And, and so in a tragedy like that, absolutely between lack of knowledge and the sort of weight of clothing, mm. uh, a few yards would be insurmountable. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, it, it's funny how, you know, one of the things we joked about at the conference was what, when you're looking into mermaids, of course, you get sent mermaid knickknacks and all of these yes. mermaidy things. Yes. And, I get that too, and I'm okay with that because I like that I've got something relatable in my very strange life. But um, it takes you into all of these places that you just yeah. wouldn't think about. Like mermaiding is very much uh, a social history. Um, Absolutely. Well, and so it dates back to, um, you know, I mean, it goes back and there's different in lots of different cultures. There are lots of different kinds of mermaids. And my expertise is really on the, the sort of Western Christian idea of mermaids. But, mm. you know, there's long histories of mermaids and femininity and danger um that are sort of all tied up in cultural ideas of water and what it is and it, it is a huge i mean it is a lens through which you can kind of see um different cultures and their perceptions on their relationships with the natural world yeah well thank you i mean it's it's a pleasure to talk to you and i remember that conference uh fondly Absolutely. Yes, it was it was lovely. And it was lovely to meet lots of people and to hear lots of different perspectives and to continue. I continue to get to, you know, follow things that people are are putting out. And even though I'm not really um, doing things strictly on mermaids anymore, uh, obviously, mm. I am keenly still keenly interested and uh, excited to see sort of, I, you know, I hope the diversification of mermaid representation continues uh, and that everyone bad swimmer or not, mm. um, standard feminine beauty or not, uh, mm. can find a, a way into that. Because I, I do think there is um, there is truth that we need uh, ambassadors to other cognition, other realities in the world, um, and other perspectives than our own. It's definitely been my experience that whilst I had to eventually admit within myself that I wanted to see the beautiful mermaids, that many, many people relate to this um, myth. And, and the biggest draw for people is either wanting to see one or wanting to be one or mm -hmm. both. And that I feel, I think and feel that that actually transcends the boundaries of all the original films and storylines. It's that wish fulfillment that is the deepest part of it. Yeah, perhaps. I think we all want the ability to transform. Mm. And I think we all want magic in the world somehow. Yeah. On that, I will end the Zoom, the magic all right. of our era. <laughs> Thank you that, so much. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Take care. Bye. Bye.